Good evening, everyone who are joining from Singapore and good afternoon for folks joining from India. On behalf of Thai Singapore, we welcome you to today's session, Discussion on Tax Implications of Cross-Border Investments, organized by Thai Singapore in collaboration with Elsia Partners. Moderator for today's session is Shilpa Menon, Senior Director, India, Elsia Capital Partners. Over to you, Shilpa. Thank you so much, Sudha. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I welcome all of you uh, from India and Singapore, wherever else you may have logged in. And good afternoon, good evening, according to your time zones. Uh, uh, before we begin into this session, and I, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have come in with a lot of questions, but before that, would love to introduce very shortly LCR Capital and, of course, our distinguished guests on the panel today. Uh, LCR Capital is actually a private investment and advisory services firm headquartered in Westford, Connecticut. Uh, we have six other office locations, including one in Mumbai, one in Dubai, and one in Singapore. We are, uh, we are primarily focusing on alternative residency products, uh, such as immigrant investor programs, including the EB-5, Portugal Golden Visa, et cetera. And over the last few years, we've also expanded our offerings to include global wealth management solutions. That's a little bit about us. Uh, now I would want to introduce uh, our speakers here, uh, Sridhar and Lloyd from Grand Thornton Bharat. Uh, Grand Thornton is a member of Grand Thornton International, uh, which really does not need much introduction. It's one of the preeminent Indian professional services firm. They're one of the largest fully integrated assurance tax and advisory firms in India, uh, and they have over 5,600 5, people and presence in around 15 countries. Uh, I'll briefly introduce each of them. Uh, Sridhar is tax partner at Grand Thornton Bharat uh, uh, and where he's responsible for the tax practice of Chennai and the Kochi offices. He's also responsible for the transaction tax practice of the firm for South India. He has over 24 years of post-qualification experience in tax and regulatory matters. Uh, a significant part of his career was spent in Delhi, where he gained expertise in dealing with complex and varied tax and regulatory matters of multinational corporations. He shifted to Chennai in 20, 2006, and prior to joining GTB, he ran a boutique consulting firm which specialized in tax, regulatory, and m and functions. A little bit about Lloyd. Uh, he's partner and leader of the U.S. tax services at GTB. He's a, he focuses on the U.S. corporate and individual tax advisory and compliance. He's got a lot of experience in assisting Indian companies in setting up their U.S. operations and also managing the entire range of U.S. tax compliance requirements. Uh, he specializes in uh, both corporate and individual tax returns in the U.S., U.S. m and tax advisory, tax due diligence, international tax planning, what have you. So he's essentially, in a nutshell, a U.S. tax expert. Uh, that's a little bit about all of us over here on this panel. Uh, and I think without much ado, I would like to really launch into this fireside chat that we planned here. You know, at LCR Capital, we're definitely seeing a significant increase in the number of families wanting to go global. When I say wanting to go global, I mean two or three things primarily. One is that people are looking actively at alternative residencies, trying to invest to get a foothold in another country, which is not their home country. Second is, of course, portfolio diversification, right? Uh, a lot of families do believe with their asset base, uh, it does not uh, bode well to stay out of one of the largest markets, uh, equity capital markets. For example, the US has around 60%, uh, you know, it, it commands 60% of the equity capital markets in the world. So, it definitely makes sense to start diversifying your portfolio outside your home country. Third, of course, access to global ideas. Uh, your home country may not have access to all of the ideas that you want to invest in. And definitely you must go where, uh, you know, what, what investment excites you and that may not always be in your home country. So these are the reasons uh, why primarily we're seeing a lot of families looking outwards. And for the purpose of today's discussion, we're going to focus a little bit more on the U.S. side of investments, U.S. Uh, uh, geography, and also looking more deeply into what impacts Indians and non-resident Indians, because, you know, there are specific regulations that as you all know apply to us, which is, you know, the LRS, FEMA, et cetera, right, which is probably not such a big problem for other nationalities. So with that, let me first ask a very open-ended question to you, Sridhar. Uh, what should Indian residents and NRIs take into consideration from a tax and regulatory 
perspective when they are trying to make an offshore transaction. Now, I'm right now only talking about offshore transaction, not talking about US specifically. Uh, whenever they are looking to uh, invest outside, what are the first few things that they need to take care of? Yeah, so Shilpa, I think the, the as in as you know, the legal and regulatory framework in India is a very unique to the extent that there is an exchange control law, which kind of plays as the framework, plays out as a framework for us to consider. And then tax obviously is a consequence, but an important one. Uh, and, and therefore, so if we were to look at the framework under exchange control law, we've moved uh, quite a few uh, strides into making things more liberal. But exchange control law has had a history of uh, uh, invoking fear uh, in uh, in investors as well as in uh, in people's minds. So to dispel the fear, uh, at least from a uh, framework perspective, individual residents are permitted to invest up to USD two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars in uh, multiple. Instru uh, instruments and or assets, including equity shares uh, and or investments in trusts or uh, 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 immobile property, etc. And that limit is uh, per person per year. And that is for applicable to any investments that go out from the country as a resident. Uh, uh, and the definition of a resident in exchange control law is slightly different from that uh, that is used in income tax. Uh, uh, but that is the primary framework that you need to bear in mind. The second thing you need to know is there is a separate set of framework that applies to strategic investments, uh, especially by corporates. And therefore, uh, a lot of investments that go out uh, as promoters are seen in a different lens as compared to the liberalized remittance scheme uh, or the LRS window. So these are two distinct windows that apply with their own conditions and they have to kind of be measured independently. That's as far as the exchange control law is concerned. Tax uh, India loves to tax uh, uh, any asset rest held by a resident. So we will not let go of that right. Uh, and therefore, any direct uh, ownership by a resident of an overseas uh, asset uh, and that any return on account of that, whether by way of dividend or by way of capital gain on the sale, will be liable to tax in India if that individual is a tax resident of India. And that's really this kind of framework that broadly applies in, in, uh, in uh, all situations. Understood. I think that that's useful. Uh, I think question, follow-up question to Lloyd, uh, those who are in, you know looking to invest specifically in the US, what are the tax implications? And uh, Sridhar did mention that India loves to tax. What happens? Do they end up paying tax in the US and India both? So uh, interestingly, uh, while US is known to be uh, also a jurisdiction which which has its own fancy for you know taxing everything they can, but particularly for non-residents investing uh, you know in securities, so they, they buy shares of a US uh, company, for example, as an Indian resident or a Singapore resident, if you buy uh, let's say shares of Apple or Google, uh, capital gains will not be taxable in the US if you are not a US resident. If you don't have a green card, you don't have a U.S. citizen, you are a foreign citizen, you're living outside the U.S., uh, capital gains uh, will not be taxable in the U.S. In, in most country, in most companies. There are certain exceptions if you're investing in real estate owning companies uh, where more than 50 percent of the value is derived by U.S. real estate and they want to tax it. Obviously, if you buy a house in the U.S. or you, you know, make any specific uh, uh, tangible investments in the U.S., there could be both federal and state implications. Uh, but from a securities perspective, from a pure portfolio diversification perspective, you're investing in the U.S. stock markets. Uh, there will be no tax on capital gains. Uh, you will still be taxed on any dividends that you receive. So there will be withholding taxes based on where you are coming from. The applicable treaties will apply. 
Uh, but capital gains is a sweet spot where uh, there will be no uh, income tax element there. Uh, but here's the catch, okay? Uh, although no income tax is applicable, uh, the U.S. still considers U.S. equity uh, as an asset for estate duty purposes. So therefore, you know, non-residents investing in the U.S. markets, it's important to plan around this aspect. Uh, the threshold for estate duty for non-citizens is a very, very small amount, is 60,000 U.S. dollars. So if you own more than $60,000 of U.S. stock, and that stock is passed on to your next of kin upon your demise, then the U.S. estate duty will kick it. So while there's no income tax on you know, capital gains derived from selling shares uh, on the U.S. markets, estate duty is something that definitely needs to be planned for. That's very, very insightful. Uh, you know, since we are on the Thai platform, you know, we, our audience obviously comes from an entrepreneurial background. Are there any additional considerations that we should take into account if then they're starting a business overseas uh, from an Indian or U.S. regulatory tax perspective? Uh, Sridhar, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, so Shilpa, like I said, the, uh, the hat that you wear uh, matters. So if you are investing as a promoter, uh, 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 there are some conditions that you need to be wary of. The limit of an individual still remains at the hundred and the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and it's a subsumed limit. So everything else also gets included, including your investment as a promoter. Uh, but the key element here is that uh, as a promoter of a foreign company, it that foreign company should be only in active business, one. And two, that company cannot then have step-down subsidiaries anywhere in the world. Uh, and this is a condition which a lot of people miss uh, in making. And this is classified as overseas direct investments by individuals. So there's a class of uh, investors as individuals which allow you to do this there is flexibility for individuals to become promoters of foreign companies but there is this rule that rbi will not allow a step down subsidiary below that entity and the 250 thousand dollars still applies to that individual's uh, ownership in that company of course it's an annual limit so there is a reset and therefore, investments can happen over a period of time. And it is very much possible that uh, five individuals or six individuals, all of you join together and do this investment under the overseas direct investment route. That's a distinct route. And of course, if you were to use a pooling vehicle in India, which means you set up an entity in India, that in itself is a distinct overseas direct investment window, which allows you to measure the uh, the limit basis, the net worth of the entity in India. And uh, four times of the net worth of the Indian uh, vehicle that you create. So if you create a company, four times of its net worth is the possibility for such in such uh, such an entity to invest overseas. and as a as a legal entity, you can still have step down subsidiaries, and there are no restrictions there. Uh, and therefore, the flexible way of investing overseas has always been routing investments through company forms uh, in India, and that's been the preference as such. But yes, these are two distinct windows, and you need to be wary of, uh, especially investments as residents. Uh, when you do this but if you were at any point a non-resident and if you had saved sufficient money uh, from your uh, earnings as a non-resident uh, your coming back to India doesn't make that that saving a resident investment so you are outside of the requirement of exchange control law compliance if you held uh, assets uh, or uh, bank accounts or money in an overseas account uh, from what you saved in the past as a non-resident. So th these are three distinct possibilities that kind of roll out, and uh, each of them kind of play out uh, in their own uh, in their own uh, way. 
Right. So I think coming back to your ODI that you're talking about, the pooled one, uh, can they can the entity then invest directly outside in the US, for example, or uh, is it required that it only invests in the uh, you know industry that it is or the segment that it is in India? That is the question a lot of people ask. Right. Uh, Shilpa, the link question is, if you are uh, investing overseas in a financial services sector, uh, there are distinct conditions. India is uh, put an additional condition that uh, an outbound investment in financial services that are regulated overseas should also be done by somebody who's regulated by the country Indian country's regulator, that is the Reserve Bank or the insurance uh, regulator or uh, or any of the other uh, financial services regulators. So uh, for financial services, there is a higher benchmark and threshold to make overseas investments. For other uh, investments in other sectors, pretty much uh, flat. There is no uh, restriction in moving around uh, in businesses. Uh, real estate in itself is a prohibition, so you need to be wary of real estate and financial services, really, how we would classify it uh, in restriction. Got it, got it. Uh, so, you know, in under the LRS, is there any restriction on what kind of in, instruments you can invest in? Or, uh, you know, there is also the issue of round tripping. It would be great if you can just, you know, highlight all of that. Yeah, so... In LRS, an individual is permitted to invest in listed shares as well as unlisted company shares. And in a limited way, they are also allowed to invest in uh, in pooling vehicle instruments like trust uh, units as well as uh, debt instruments. Uh, so any securities in that definition kind of broadly fits in into the understanding of uh, LRS. Uh, investments. Uh, again, LRS, like I said, is also broken out into strategic and non-strategic investments. Strategic investments are only in equity. Uh, and o- if you get measured in ODI, uh, overseas direct investments, you are measured only for equity investments. You can't do, you can't give a loan uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the LRS, under the LRS window. Uh, non-strategic is portfolio in nature and therefore even listed stock uh, and securities are also covered there and you are free to uh, 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 take a investor's view on uh, such investments, such assets. Got it. And uh, what are the uh, LRS and uh, FEMA restrictions when it comes to close family members, you know, if they are pooling LRS money and they want to together invest in an asset, what, what should they keep in mind? So LRS as a window allows a family to kind of club all its investments together uh, for a, a larger investment threshold. So $250,000 applies per individual family member. Uh, but there are there is some catch uh, in the way this is actually implemented, especially in terms of how the investments are made from that pool, because there is an expectation that the asset tags to a particular individual within the family as well, or it is jointly held to reflect the fact that you pooled this uh, when you made the joint investment. Uh, and therefore, there is an expectation that it cannot be that one individual holds uh, all the assets using the pool of a family. Uh, it, it is uh, therefore suggested and right for all of the individuals to hold those assets jointly if they have kind of pooled this together. And there are some nuances on uh, uh, if you were to. Uh, uh, have uh, a bank account abroad to do this. Uh, So the cash sits overseas, but it is used to pool this, uh, 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 these, the money and then used to invest. The investment in itself still needs to meet the criteria of uh, joint ownership. Uh, Whereas the money pooling into the bank account 
uh, is something that is fungible. So the $250,000 doesn't distinguish who sent the money out uh, at the at the immediate level. Understood. So basically, that is more like a path uh, to finally invest. And I think the final investment needs to be jointly held. Uh, Lloyd, coming to you, does, uh, you know, there are some people who get a little bit confused on uh, tax residency versus uh, actually getting a green card or getting, uh, in case of US, of course, it's similar, getting green card is equal to tax residency. But what is the, does getting a citizenship of a country means you automatically become a tax resident or, you know, if you get a PR or like a golden visa or something, do you become automatically a tax resident of that place or what does it, what does it, what requires so uh, you know all countries have have different rules and uh, us is one among only i think two or three countries in the world which has a citizenship based taxation uh, india also we are largely on a on a residency based not really citizenship based although we have some nuances uh, now where we are looking to you know uh, get some levers there but largely when i talk about the us uh, it is based on citizenship as well as uh, based on the green card so if you get a green card, uh, of course, uh, you become uh, a U.S. tax resident, uh, even though you are not staying in the U.S. So physically, you may be living overseas, uh, but the moment you get a green card, uh, your tax residency uh, you know, in that effect will, will start. Uh, if you were born in the U.S., you have a U.S. passport uh, uh, and you are a U.S. citizen, uh, then also uh, you know, you're liable to taxes on your global income. Uh, accidental Americans uh, is a term that they usually use for you know people who are just born in the U.S. and moved overseas. So in that sense, the U.S. doesn't really care you know whether you're spending time in the country or not. Uh, if you are uh, a green card holder, if you are a U.S. passport holder, uh, you are subject to U.S. taxes uh, and that too on your global incomes. Yes, there are tax treaties. Um, that can limit the impact uh, in some cases uh, on certain categories of income. Uh, but by and large, uh, you're entitled to uh, not only report your global income uh, to tax in the U.S., but there's a whole host of uh, disclosure obligations. So all your foreign financial assets uh, that you hold, and there's a great degree of disclosure that is, uh, is required uh, you know, if you're filing U.S. taxes. Understood. And uh, from a residency by investment perspective, when does a investor become liable to file and pay taxes in the US? I guess it's when they would get their green card in hand, right? Yes. So uh, particularly in the investment uh, visa regime, uh, there is a sort of a wait period from the time the investment is made uh, till the time uh, the individual actually gets the, the green card. So there is, in fact, uh, you know, once they get the, the in-principle approval, they have sort of a six-month window to step foot in the U.S. Uh, so it's basically when they land on U.S. shores in a particular year is when uh, their green card uh, F takes effect and therefore their tax residency starts. So, so that year is important and that year uh, you would be uh, what is called a dual resident because oh. for a certain portion of the year, uh, you would be a non-resident, certain portion you'd be a resident. Uh, and taxes work slightly differently there. So it, it's important to be careful in that year. Uh, and it's also a, a planning opportunity because there are a lot of things that can be done before you actually trigger your residency. Uh, so the year in which uh, you get the green card is an important uh, uh, year and uh, a good amount of planning can be and help in you know, optimizing your tax situation there. Understood. And uh, coming back to you, Sridhar, uh... You talked about the LRS for residents, right? I mean, there are uh, some regulations on the NRIs and how how much they can actually repatriate. I believe they can repatriate a million dollars in a year and it's not uh, 250. I just wanted to understand uh, what are the rules here and what are the restrictions? What is the kind of money that they can take money out? Is it something that they completely own or earned or is, can it be a gift from somebody uh, in India? Yeah, so Shilpa, the NRI by definition means that you've gone outside the country, but you are from India origin and therefore you classify yourself as a person of Indian origin and NRI in that definition. So if you were an NRI, uh, basically you're sitting outside the country and you're, you've earned money in India in the past and it's parked in a bank account in India 
typically an NRO or an NRE account. NRO account is what you would park that money into. And the rules uh, therefore allow you to take that uh, up to a $1 million in a year to kind of take take that money back to to your uh, to the country in which you are staying or where you want to put that into application uh, and uh, and to that extent india has made it flexible to at least repatriate that much as a as a legacy resident who can take that money out uh, having uh, having the, given the fact that he is staying now overseas so that's the flexibility and in that uh what all is permitted is whatever he had earned uh or is continuing to earn as a resident uh whether it's disposal of uh, uh assets in india like shares uh, or whether it is uh, running income like rent uh, or interest or uh, uh, gain on uh, disposal of certain assets mm -hmm. Uh, immovable property, there is a twist in the tail. You can't uh, remit more than uh, proceeds of two immovable properties in a lifetime, and you'll have to elect uh, for uh, for you to be able to do that. Uh, but the $1 million is a reasonably high limit, and RBI permits uh, you to remit uh, other proceeds if, if there is a fit case to do this. So you can go back to RBI for an approval uh, if you had inherited uh, or you had got uh, an asset uh, which is valued more and you disposed it off but in principle 1 million is really what you can take out in a year uh, and once you've taken it off out of the country mm -hmm. you are not measured further on what you do as a non-resident uh, on that asset and therefore you're free to apply that to earn other income overseas or you're free to use it in the best way that you think possible. On gifts, uh, once you've taken it money out, uh, the, as a non-resident, you're free to gift this to other subject to law of other countries. Uh, but if you were to uh, gift, get this as a gift from a resident, then for that resident, uh, the hundred and the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit applies uh, for you to get the gift. So uh, for the resident who's gifting you, he is still subjected to the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit. Understood. So if they, if they would want to uh, remit five hundred out, they probably need the two people in their family to give them two fifty each, right? I mean, technically speaking. Yeah, and uh, yeah. gifting has to kind of the underlying love and affection should certainly show out, <laughs> uh, stand out, and that's uh, see because exchange control law is a law of intention as well. So we shouldn't use inst or possibilities under law. Uh, for for potential misuse. So where there is genuine uh, uh, reason to gift, it's better to justify it and get the money as gift. Or uh, otherwise, there may be there are other ways to deal with it. But uh, not not that gift is the only way to get that answer. Understood. Understood. Makes sense. Uh Lloyd, coming to you, I think uh, some people want to ask if, uh, you know, if, if you are in the U.S. and you do give up a U.S. card, is uh, green card, is there an exit tax? Yes. So uh, the U.S. doesn't make, uh, you know, giving up the green card also uh, uh, so easy. So uh, there is, however, uh, there are a few exceptions there. And the first exception is if you are not what is called a long-term resident. Long-term resident is once you've held a green card for at least uh, eight years of the last 15 years, right? And you, so in the first sort of seven years, you have a window to, to exit or give up your green card without being subject to the exit tax. So if you get a green card this year, you have to make sure that before you enter your eighth year, uh, you really make up your mind whether you, you want to stay uh, in the US or you want to keep your green card for the longer term. Uh, so that's the first seven year sort of get out of jail free card uh, that you should, uh, you know, really, really evaluate. And that, that is something that we talk to a lot of clients. Again, 
Uh, it's difficult uh, when somebody gets a green card today. It's not that simple to uh, because they've they've obviously uh, you know either invested time or money uh, or other things to get that right. But to take a decision whether in seven years we will need it, we will not need it. Our kids may be studying in the US. So it's a difficult decision. I understand, but from a purely economic perspective, a seven year is a hard stop uh, yeah, there. Uh, so that is one one uh, important date to be aware of. But let's say we, we are way, way past that and right? we are beyond the seven year window. We've held the green card for several decades. And now the individual is looking at uh, moving outside the US by giving up the green card. Uh, the important consideration of the thresholds there, there are a couple of thresholds which are important. Uh, one is their global net worth threshold, which is $2 million. Uh, the second is your average net income tax liability threshold for the last five years. And that currently is 171,000 US dollars. So if an individual has a net worth below $2 million, if the last five years average tax liability is below $171,000, then basically what the US is saying is you're not really a very, very high income or high net worth tax payer. We'll allow you to exit uh, the US without being subject to exit taxes. But if you are above these thresholds, then tax planning is required. Uh, the individuals have what is known as the lifetime exclusion from gift and estate taxes. That's currently about 11 and a half billion. It's likely to go up to 12 million next year with inflation. So up to about $12 million, potentially an individual could look at, you know, gifting out uh, some of their assets to their family members and try and get themselves below the $2 million limit. Of course, the important part here is uh, they're not tripping the uh, average income tax liability uh, trigger because there's no way to deal with that. So that's an important, that's a hard metric. Uh, and again, to deal with that is uh, sometimes people look at extending uh, you know, that by one more year and trying to ensure that they minimize their incomes in that particular year to fall below the uh, tax liability threshold. If these two things are, are manageable and these two things are planned for, and this is possible, we have done that in quite a few cases, then we can still work around uh, the exit taxes. But let's say that is also not possible. You are, you know, you know, upwards of 100 mil or 200 mil, and it's, it's, it's not possible to, you know, practically get to a 2 million below number. Uh, then you have to look at, uh, you know, exit taxes. And what exit taxes really mean is uh, if you were to sell all your assets and global assets, if you were to sell all your global assets, what is the mark to market game that is sitting in your global portfolio? Basically, the US is saying, uh, you know, I need my uh, share of uh, taxes on, on that mark to market gain, which you have earned while you are a US person. Uh, there is a small uh, exemption threshold, it's around $700,000. So let's say if you have $100 million in net worth, if you were to sell everything you own today, maybe you make 30 million, a deemed capital gain, right? So on that 30 million, they'll give you the base exemption of 700,000. Uh, but the balance 29.3 million will be subject to uh, long-term capital gains tax of the US, which is currently 20% plus a 3.8% surcharge. So effectively, you're paying as much as 24% uh, to exit the US. That is one consequence. Uh, but there's also another rider. And the other rider is you get a unwanted tag of something which is called a covered expatriate, which basically means that once you have exited the US after paying gift taxes, they don't want such individuals to send or, or use it as a backdoor channel to send assets back to their US relatives or children or other uh, you know, uh, people that they know. So they will levy a gift tax on the recipient for any assets that have been received from a covered expatriate. So they're saying if you're quitting the US, please go along with your family, relatives, et cetera, all of it. Uh, if you have US uh, you know, children or other relatives who are expected to inherit assets from you, then those inheritances will also be subject to US estate taxes. And during a lifetime, uh, if they give you certain gifts, covered expatriates give US citizens certain gifts, then those gifts will be taxable. So it can get quite complicated. And therefore, a lot of people try as hard as they can to avoid uh, the covered expatriate status. Uh, so, so a lot of work needs to go into that, into you know, how we want to plan around that. That's very useful, I think, uh, because that's a very uh, question that we very frequently hear. Thanks for that, Lloyd. Uh, you know, I want to 
talk a little bit about uh, investors who are contemplating investing in the US and of course uh, tax cannot be a deal breaker for somebody who's wanting to invest or changing you know they're looking for a change in their uh, lifestyles so what can they possibly do in terms of planning ahead and optimizing their tax liabilities uh, can i mean i think first shridhar you and then uh, lloyd if you could throw some light on how this can be planned how much time it takes and you know what they can possibly do about this uh so uh, from an individual tax point of view tax residency uh rules in india certainly kind of follow international principles to the extent that anything over 183 days stay in india uh in a year in a financial year which runs from uh, 1st of april to 31st of march will make the individual most likely a tax resident in india uh and therefore uh, uh the first thing to check is whether or not such an individual is a resident or not uh and if he has stayed in the country for that much period or more uh, then on what uh, assets is he liable to tax in india is the second question which as a resident india wants to tax all of the global income of that individual with some limited exceptions for not ordinarily resident individuals who uh, who are measured in a slightly liberal way to not necessarily tax all of the overseas sourced income uh, but in principle uh, that's uh, that's how india would kind of play this out and there is obviously like in any uh, any multi country juris if india has a treaty uh, uh, country with uh, with whom we have uh, with the individual is uh, resident of there is a tie breaker rule as well where uh, permanent residence is also tested for purposes of uh, treaty benefit so broadly those would be the guideline uh, line items that you need to kind of assess um, um, uh shilpa i don't know if i've answered all of your question but that's the sense i kind of get at a at a big picture about level. that i mean lloyd would you want to chime in sure sure uh see we work with a lot of families who are you know contemplating uh moving uh, overseas particularly to the us um uh, and uh, i think there is a there's a good window to do a lot of activities and it's basically the arbitrage between you know how india taxes certain assets vis a vis you know how the us does and uh, india for all its worth there are a lot of avenues where uh, you know we are taxed at a lesser rate than the us or in some cases not taxed at all uh, so uh, there are things that individuals can do before they move to the us you know simple things like you know what we call stepping up the basis in your assets so if you have let's say long term equity in the stock markets uh, you know up until a few years ago there were no capital gains on long term but now we have a limited uh, you know capital gains tax with some grandfathering cost benefits so i think that's important to ensure that uh, you know at least you trigger the gains before you leave uh, you know uh, to for the us uh, so that you pay only the india liability and then if required you buy those assets back so you're only paying the india taxes on uh, what's perhaps a much smaller tax number Uh, and you still retain those assets uh, uh, from a long term holding perspective so we can plan for trying and uh, you know triggering certain taxes which is more favorable from an india perspective uh, before you move to the us other things like specifically on the estate side a lot of people look at trusts as a structure to move in assets uh, that they want to leave for either for their parents or for other beneficiaries uh because of the us estate laws uh, so that's another avenue that needs uh, you know planning uh, us does have certain look back rules anything that you set up within 5 years of moving to the us there's an extra layer of scrutiny uh, so you may not be able to avoid income taxes uh, but definitely you can achieve certain estate tax uh, you know advantages uh, so those sort of things can be done people who are mobile okay people who have the ability to move uh, you know cross border uh either themselves or with their family uh, a lot of more options open up if you're able to move to jurisdictions uh, which hopefully don't tax you you know something like uh, let's say dubai hong kong or other jurisdictions uh, maybe even a singapore which which has a good you know capital gains tax regime and otherwise a low tax regime uh, there are further things that can be optimized which uh, maybe in india may not offer you 
and i see a new uh, certain countries coming up with uh, you know radically new regimes something which is known as a digital nomad uh, i know costa rica has come up with a with a sort of a plan where even if you stay there for two years they're not going to tax you uh, they'll give you a visa to stay there work there for a couple of years uh, and you don't have to pay taxes on your global income so i think this is an evolving space and with uh, you know things moving uh, to the home zone work from home work from anywhere we'll probably see a lot more uh, you know regimes uh, but yes uh, you know getting a us green card or a passport in that sense becomes a slight deterrent because it still holds on to uh, the taxing rights even though they are not physically there uh, but having said that there are enough opportunities to uh, look at from a personal uh, you know standpoint uh, and things can be definitely planned around thanks a lot i think uh, that pretty much wraps up all the questions that i wanted to ask uh, I, but now we've seen a lot of questions come in from the audience so i'd like to pick one by one if that's okay with both of you uh, and uh, i'll just read out the question and any one of you shridhar lloyd you can elect to answer it um first one uh, i think this is for Shri, uh, shridhar uh, for odi through a company is the limit of 100% of the net worth be considered or the limit is still at 400% of the net worth yeah for the for odi through a company it's a 400% limit of the net worth of that entity as per its last audited accounts okay got it and uh, in terms of uh, how are the taxes as per the dta with us I, i'm assuming they're talking about india if they invest in a company through an individual or from a company in india to a company in usa and they talking about dividends i'm not very clear what they mean by that but yeah so i'll take that uh, so dividends uh, there are different rates for individuals versus uh, you know corporate investors so if an individual investor is receiving dividends from a us company will generally be taxed at 25% that's the withholding tax uh, however if you are a corporate shareholder and own at least 10% shares in a us company uh, then potentially the withholding taxes will be at 15% uh, so 15% if you are a corporate owning more than 10% or otherwise it's 25% under the tax treaty as opposed to that the domestic law in the us is 30% uh, on withholding but it will, the tt will reduce that right and uh, somebody's asked that they invested in something like the eb5 investment is it taxable in india and us both any dividend or return that they uh, earn on that so on the eb5 they may be getting a nominal interest uh, so that is taxable in the us in most cases the the uh, taxes would be withheld at source uh, for the individual so the us taxes would be taken care of uh, but yes india would also tax any interest income that they get on on that return yeah i mean usually uh, it's quite uh, you know nominal it's very small amounts it does not really move the needle much is what you've seen uh, is the rule that we pay us tax first on us income and india tax first on indian income and then report both incomes on both returns a good rule i mean is that is that how it's usually played out yeah so so that that's a tricky one shridhar i'll take that because we've done this practice with a lot of people so yes if you have uh, you know incomes on both sides of the border uh each country will obviously have the right to tax uh its own income first that is where the sourcing rules come into play uh, so india will have the first right to tax indian sourced income uh, similarly the us reserves the right to tax us sourced income first so in in both your tax returns uh, uh, you will have to pay taxes uh you know first on your local country sourcing uh, and then you bring in your uh, foreign country income and take tax credits uh so that usually is the case and it's, it's a good rule yeah uh, there are some nuances uh, you know capital gains if you are uh living in the us and earning india capital gains there is a potential for you know getting double tax because particularly for capital gains the sourcing rules uh that the us has and sourcing rule that india has are at opposite end india will source capital gains based on where the company is resident whereas the us sources capital gains where the seller is resident Um, and seller is defined by whether seller has a tax home that can get a bit complicated but in a nutshell capital gains is one area if uh, the individual is living in the us and investing in the indian uh, you know capital markets uh, then capital gains is one area where uh, one needs to pay some extra attention uh, but otherwise yes uh, local country income will be first tax in that country and then the foreign income foreign income has to be added uh, and appropriate foreign tax credits can be taken 
Understood. Uh, one question again on EB5. I think can we open a joint bank account overseas along with a minor and transfer 500k through LRS for investment purpose? Shridhar, you want to take that? Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, Shilpa, yes, uh, the minors uh, minor is in itself a distinct person, and therefore it's possible to club uh, his uh, his. Uh, uh, limit also for uh, the parent to uh, jointly uh, invest, but the minor will need to be a joint account holder or some form of ownership has to be established to be compliant with the LRS rule to make sure that uh, that his limit is distinctly uh, identified. Understood. Got it. Uh... Yes. So I think there are a few more questions. I'll just pick them up. Some of them have come in the chat window. I would request people to place the questions, please, in the question and answer uh, window instead of the chat. Uh, So if a property is sold in India while we are residents or citizens in Singapore, what is the tax implication on the sale made? This is uh, specific to NRIs, I guess. How does it get treated? So if the person is, so if he's an NRI, he's uh, logically not staying in India, Shilpa. So we'll be happy to forego that tax uh, in India because he's not tax resident and it's an overseas asset. Uh, But if he's a resident, obviously, whatever he earns from wherever will be liable to tax. So if it's an NRI, it's a tricky question. I need to know where is he resident of to get that answer. So, so Singapore has the right uh, to tax him on that income first. Uh, and India, if it's an India, so did he say it's an India asset or? Uh, I, yes, I yes. the property sold in India. Yeah. So property sold in India, obviously the gain, uh, like Lloyd said, will be subjected to tax in India uh, on whatever that difference is. So if it's, uh, if it's immobile property, it will be taxed uh, at 20% uh, rate on long term uh, and short term will be at a very high rate of 40 odd percent. So depending on what period he holds this asset in, it will be uh, a fairly high tax rate for removal property. For shares, uh, it's slightly lower rate. 10% is the long term rate uh, and uh, short term rate again goes back to 40%. Got it. There's one question that's come in, which is how is the tax rate for rental income from USA for an Indian citizen? So rental income is taxed uh, as what we call ordinary income. So it depends on the total income of the taxpayer. So if it's an Indian citizen, I'm assuming uh, and rental income is the only income. Uh, then the tax labs in the US will start at about 15% and uh, the peak tax rate is 37%. So depending on what the total rental income is, uh, it will be taxed at graduated rates. And this is only federal taxes. Depending on where the asset is located, you will also uh, have potential state and some cases even even local taxes. So, uh, but it is going to depend on the the slab in which the the income falls. So it will be at graduated rates at uh, ordinary income uh, as per the federal taxes. Got it. Shri, the one question that comes up very often is, uh, can an Indian resident gift another Indian resident in foreign currency? Uh, So, foreign currency, uh, uh, so let's answer this question slightly differently. Between two residents, exchange control law logically doesn't apply. Uh, But if you are buying foreign currency, you will be measured by the limit of $250,000 for such a gift. But uh, the fact that you are sending it abroad makes it a bit more complicated because you have one, your own limit as a resident, and then you're trying to piggyback on somebody else's limit of $250,000. So you can't uh, double count uh, that limit uh, or you can't take benefit for this in uh, in double counting it. So you will, in an overall basis, be subjected to a limit of $250,000 any which way. And this in itself, uh, the banker won't permit such a remittance in the first place. Uh, so he will 
want you to use only one limit which is either you uh, get the gift in india and then limit your remittance to $250000 as a resident uh, or uh, the 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 remittance can't go in dollars so let, let's be clear on that so you can't gift in dollars between two residents if i was to answer it slightly differently sorry i was on mute so yeah the other question that's come in is what are the implications to be mindful of for a us born minor if he or she decides to give up the us citizen when they citizenship when they turn 18 yeah so there is in fact a 6 month window even there so before the uh, the minor turns 18 and a half uh, potentially there is an option to get out and give up the citizenship without being subject to the ex- exit taxes So I think that that window is important uh, between eighteen and eighteen and a half uh, is where the minor uh, can potentially decide to give up citizenship. Uh, it's more of an immigration question, but yes, that six month window is critical, uh, and that needs to be monitored. Got it. And uh, another question that's come in: a person holding a U.S. passport and stays in India for more than five years, uh, does he need to file the APRs, etc., for the investment made in the overseas company? uh so that uh, depends on from what source he had invested originally so if he had invested this from his overseas source uh savings the requirement for filing apr etc doesn't arise if he had sourced the original investment from india uh from india uh, income then apr etc will apply okay got it and what is the taxability in india for income from offshore accounts for an nri i mean is an nri subject to any taxes in india for income from offshore accounts uh when he says offshore it means offshore of india or yes, offshore I, of yes i'm guessing that yeah right because if he's an nri he is already offshore yeah and an offshore account of an nri shouldn't get taxed in india exactly uh but if the nri was staying in india and is a resident uh, for so for tax reasons then this will be taxed in india so is his period of stay in india will matter uh, to be answering that question fully got it uh, with respect to ftc does india tax authorities do india tax authorities give credit for state taxes paid in us as well as uh, federal tax so the treaty only covers federal taxes as an individual uh, you're unlikely to get state tax credit having said that in a corporate context uh, there have been certain case laws where credit has been given for even state taxes in india but as an individual it is it largely going to be uh, uh, the federal taxes on got it one other question i think a lot of our uh, you know friends in bangalore etc would be having this question is how are esops held by an indian resident of a us company taxed in india and in the us okay so for as far as india is concerned the esop is nothing but a security held by a resident uh, and uh, uh, if if it is an underlying equity share uh it will be so on a disposal of that equity share it will be taxed as capital gain uh at that point in time when the disposal of the share happens but if this esop is on account of exercising an employment in india uh the point at which the esop converts into equity uh, will also trigger a uh salary perquisite tax in india uh, on that employee which is more like a withholding expectation from the company as well to do a, what is called a tds on uh, the the perquisite value that the employee has got at the point of exercise uh and from there on it is capital gain yeah just to just to add there uh... Uh, it gets a little more complicated if the employee is globally mobile uh, so if you received esops uh, but he is actually shuttling between let's say uh, to your us assignment 
coming back to India, etc. Uh, then it also the U.S. potentially could also tax the individual at the time of exercise, depending on you know how much time uh, the individual has spent in the U.S. during the vesting period. So if you exercised employment uh, in multiple countries, then multiple countries potentially could have the right to tax your uh, perquisite element. From a disposal standpoint, it's really the year in which you are selling. Uh, if you are an Indian resident selling shares of a U.S. company, as I said earlier, as long as that U.S. company does not own significant U.S. real estate, the U.S. is not going to tax you on capital gains. You may only have to pay capital gains tax in India. But your uh, uh, perquisite element, if you are, you know, if you have done a stint in the U.S., in most cases, it's, it's not a problem for you. Your employer would have withheld uh, respective taxes in both jurisdictions. Uh, so that should take care of your uh, you know, uh, wage income elements. Right. Uh, I think we are almost out of time. So I'm just going to take quick two questions. One is, uh, uh, is are, can, can Indians use a collateral in India to take a loan in the US? Is cross-collateralization allowed, cross-border collateralization? Uh, no. So you, as an individual... Uh, this is not possible. But if you are a corporate, uh, there are possibilities that exist uh, to do this. But as an individual, no. Got it. And I think uh, one last question that I'm going to pick up is, can you please talk about deemed tax residency in India and the tax issues around this for basically for income generated in India over a specified limit? So deemed tax residency is a concept of for corporates more than individuals. Individuals, the test follows where you actually stayed. And there can be no deeming fiction there because you've stayed in a country. It's very clear you've been in that country. Uh, so so if, if this principle was only around tax residence, then it's a clear um, uh, line uh on the number of days that you stayed in in india for example more than 183 days uh but if it's uh, corporates there is deemed residency on account of effective management of businesses so if the place of effective management of a business uh, of a foreign company say singapore is uh, effectively managed from uh, by people resident in india then the Singapore entity can be treated as a deemed resident of uh, India for tax purposes and its global income will get taxed because its place of effective management is situated in India. So that's uh, you have to really worry about that if residents own uh, companies overseas, but all decisions are taken sitting in India. Right. The poem of course, room. there are some thresholds as well. So not everybody gets covered. Uh, only something over uh, 5 million or 50 crore uh, rupees is the threshold with beyond which a turnover beyond which is when you need to measure this. But by behavior, you should kind of ring fence this from beginning. Understood. I think that was a very uh, insightful session. A lot of questions came in and a lot of, uh, you know, the, the audience was clearly very engaged. Thanks a lot, uh, Sridhar and Lloyd, uh, for, you know, for your precious time over here and for patiently answering all our questions. And thanks a lot to Thai Singapore uh, for helping us arrange this. And all of you lovely audience who uh, registered and joined us today and asked us a lot of questions. Thank you so much. I hope uh, the session was useful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone.